Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Houston Museum of African American Culture. My name is Christopher Blay. I am the chief curator here. And I'm really excited for this evening's talk with artist Evita Tizano. Uh, so Evita is a Texas native. She was born in Port Arthur, not too far from here, uh, and graduated from Lamar University. She lives and works in Dallas, and we won't hold that against her. Uh, Evita's collages and paintings employ richly patterned hand-painted papers and found objects in a folk art style. Her work depicts a cast of characters in harmonious everyday scenes inspired by her family and friends, childhood memories in South Texas, personal dreams, and moments from her adult life. She's also influenced by artists Romare Bearden, Elizabeth Catlett, William Johnson, uh, and all these artists have in common with Evita their uh, depictions of joy, which kind of animates some of the works that you see here, um, her vision of Black America filled with humanity. Uh, she is a 2023 Guggenheim Fellowship, or uh, Guggenheim Foundation Fellow. Uh, it remind me to tell you a fun story about that. <laughs> <laughs> and the prestigious Elizabeth Catlett Award for the New Power Generation. Uh, she's built a career as an acclaimed multidisciplinary female artist. Her work is included in the permanent collection of the Dallas Museum of Art the African American Museum of Dallas, the Embassy at the Repu of the Republic of Madagascar, the Pizzuti Collection in Columbus, uh, Bill and Christy Gatro, who we mentioned, Arthur Lewis in Los Angeles, uh, Lester Marks, who is present somewhere in here. And the list goes on and on. Um, she is uh, very widely collected, and it's a testament to the work that she produces. Uh, I also want to mention that um, she's had several exhibitions, uh, the most awesome of which is the one we're sitting in right now, uh, Evita Tizino out of many. Uh, she also showed My Life, My Story, and Better Days at Louis de Jesus in Los Angeles. Uh, she's had several shows in uh, New York, New Orleans, um, Oakland, California. The list just literally goes on. And we'll be here all night if mm -hmm. I mention all of them. Uh, but the two really awesome things that happened just in the past 60 days is um, her interview with uh, Vanity Fair magazine mm -hmm. and her um, article in Vogue magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, two really great accomplishments for an artist uh, who is you know, whose trajectory is on the uptick. Do please help me welcome Evita Tizano. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna open my water. And you've had several of these interviews, Evita, uh, and I don't wanna go over uh, uh, very fertile ground that you've already covered. Mm -hmm. I have very specific curiosities about your work mm -hmm. that I think uh, I will share with the audience. Um, the One of the, the immediate things that comes to mind is uh, the subjects of your paintings and collages. Can you talk a little bit about your subjects? Who are they and how do they come to be in these incredible paintings? Well, some of them are me. And then some of them are family members. Some of them are made up characters. And some of, like this one right here is a made up character, but it's sharp dressed man. Everybody, I grew up in the 80s, the 70s and the 80s, and everybody knows ZZ Top, <laughs> sharp dressed man, but I made him a black man. So, um, and then one particular story, this one, and uh, my, my mom is in the audience. You could just, we didn't ride the bus. We, we had a car. And I would always tell my grandmother that I wanted to ride the bus. So <laughs> I, I put me riding a bus at the bus stop with my grandmother. So uh, that's what this is. Uh, so I, some of them are my family members. Some of them are made up characters. Yeah, I, I 
particularly notice um, that you have these really interesting groupings. Uh, but the 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 one there are two versions of this bus stop. Yeah. Do you make? Uh, do you have this? Uh, do you make series of specific paintings? Like, do you have like a series that? kind of uh, feels like it's a series of a sharp dressed man, or do you have a series that kind of feels like it's a series of the bus stop? I'm doing a series of the bus stop. That piece, the, the, the piece, the bus stop piece is very popular. People really liked it and people, people really, some people were really upset because they sold. <laughs> they were really, really upset. So I'm doing a series of bus stop pieces. Okay, that makes, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, how you grew up in Port Arthur? Yes, uh, not too far from here. Um, yes. What was your experience with art growing up? Like, did you have like a, a elementary school, high school connection to art? Did you go to museums? Did were you exposed to other artists? How did well? How did that happen? I would say my mother's an artist. My grandmother was a seamstress. She sewed amazing. My grandfather was an artist. Uh, my aunt made doll houses and dolls and also made quilts. Wow. So I was surrounded by creativity my whole life. Uh, we didn't go to museums, but I was exposed to art. I was exposed to art in magazines. And my grandmother would buy me books with different art, you know, art subjects in them. So I was exposed to it in a photographic way, but not in a real life. Yeah, that kind yeah. of, growing up with that kind of creativity, I imagine just uh, puts you in a place where uh, in your mind you have no limitations. So you, And there was no limitations. So you yeah. just, yeah. And that's a wonderful place to be as a child, but also a really freeing place to be as an artist. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember some of the first things that you made and how uh, those things, how people responded to those things? I remember my childhood, uh, my elementary school's teacher, her name was Miss Ann in uh, Lincoln High School. And she, very, she was a very supporter of my work. And I remember doing a batik uh, with crayon and melted crayons on, a, on an old sheet. Hmm. And I sold it for like $5. And I was so excited. <laughs> that was back in the 70s. And she, she was upset with me because she said, you sold it for $35. She said, you need to take your art seriously because she said, you're going to be great one day. Hmm. And I wish she still was alive so I could talk to her and tell her what happened. Yeah, wow, that's that's so encouraging. Um, yeah. A lot of kids don't get that kind of reinforcement. And I think that story is shared among a lot of artists. Uh, I interviewed another Dallas artist, Jamie Holmes, mm -hmm. and he was talking about how uh, he would make his uh, like initial, his long, oldest memories were of making paintings and drawings for his family and his friends and uh, that was like the sort of uh, the first kind of art community that he had um, but it didn't stop there for you so you no. you stayed in uh, uh, Port Arthur when did you leave Port Arthur and where did you go immediately after well my then husband uh, we moved to Dallas. Okay. And I met an artist named Frank Frazier. And if anybody knows Frank Frazier, he's a character. <laughs> and he, uh, I met him through some friends. And he told me, he said, you're an artist? He said, let me see your stuff. And so I brought him what I had. And he said, you're going on the road with me. <laughs> so I traveled with Frank for five years in a car with a smelly van <laughs> down the road, all across the country, uh, and sh this young lady that's holding the camera was with us. Really? Yes, when she was in her teens, and we went from city to city selling my work. 
Wow. So okay. before internet, <laughs> obviously yeah. before that. <laughs> Before cell, before cell phones, really. I mean, I don't even remember having a cell phone. That's but this a, was back in the day. We would roll up to a gallery and take our stuff out and say, look what we have. That's, that's how we would do. It was real gangster. <laughs> it was real gangster. That is an incredible leap of faith. It was a leap of faith. And I was doing a, conti a, a completely different style. I was okay. 18. How would you do? Yeah, okay, yeah. Describe yeah, I was doing those. impressionism. Okay. But with black people. Okay. Yeah. So those paintings, uh, you're doing those in Dallas. Did you, uh, like, what were you doing at the same time that you were doing that? You, I, I don't imagine you were established no. as an artist at the time. If you can imagine, I was doing every job you could think of. I was uh, administ uh, uh, administrative assistant. I worked for a... Um, it was called like pro staff. It was one of those staffing things. I did that on the side and then I did my artwork. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. That's what I was doing. So would you say that you had a consistent practice or did you just kind of do it to the time? time? No, I was going to paint no matter what. Whatever it took, I was going to paint. So it was consistent, but I wasn't selling consistently. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think. At the time I had, I had artwork everywhere. Yeah, I had a whole house full of art because I was painting out, out of my garage at the time. Mm. So I would paint and I would just fill the house with that. And then I would take the artwork and go on the road with Frank and then come back and then work the administrative job a little bit and then yeah. come, and go and work with Fra travel with Frank a little bit. Yeah, that's really encouraging to hear for artists who um, I mean, it's such a Especially now, it's such a luxury to have a dedicated studio outside your house uh, with the cost of real estate and just the logistics of like going somewhere else to make art. I didn't have a dedicated studio. Well, I had a dedicated studio in 1999. Mm. And I had that for until 2008. And then the economy went crazy. And that's when I became a chef. So, okay, <laughs> let's, yeah, let's get into that because, uh, yeah, tell us the story of how you did you like stumble into becoming a chef, or was that sort of I wasn't a, trained an intention? I just, I just came from good stock. My mother is a good cook, my grandmother's a good cook, <laughs> so I watched them in the kitchen and I just learned. But I'm a vegan, so okay, I, I transferred what I learned into veganism. And that's uh, tricky. How do you transfer I don't know. like I, uh, <laughs> Port Arthur, Southern Texas cooking into? It's all in the seasonings. It's all in the seasonings. So I started making food that yeah. was, I guess it was very good. I, I, I start taking it around to meetup groups. Mm. And there was a person that was there that was opening up a restaurant and said, you want to come and work in my restaurant? And I did. Wow. And it was that easy. And for the next 15 years, I worked in the restaurant industry and did artwork. Okay. So how did the, did the two inform each other? Like, do you see any kind of like uh, chef skill in like prepping and organizing, uh, translating into the kind of work that you do right now? Probably colors. Okay. Yeah. Because, you know, you have to, uh, excuse me. You have to have um, a great color palette when you are arranging food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to have good color palette. My, my work has a good color palette as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one thing that's sort of um, overwhelming in a way about the work that we have in this show. And by the way, if you have taken a look at the entire show, it occupies this space and across uh, the hall. But it is the, if I could uh, summarize this show in one word, it would be color. Yeah, uh, the next and that's important in when you're creating food, it has to be pleasing to the eye. And that's one thing I learned from creating the food and creating the artwork as well. Yeah, but I mean, your compositions are also, you know, if, as long as we're on the food analogy, uh, <laughs> like if you're making of this as like a perfect plating, you know, your compositions are really tight 
and really precise and you make it look effortless because it makes sense when you're looking at it. There. Well, that stems from my graphic design because that's what I graduated in, in in Lamar University. Okay, so the cutting and pasting that you were exactly. doing is not like Photoshop, <laughs> flick, cut, <clears throat> flick, paste. Because there was no computers back then. I graduated in 1984, so there was no computers. So, in that, well, there were big computers, a big, huge computer in 1984. And we would cut, they would come out, we would cut it, paste it, cut it out, and paste it, take it to the wax roller and paste it down, and then take a picture of it. That's what we would do. So that's what I learned. I cut my teeth on that because I worked for the local news, I worked for the newspaper at mm. Lamar, okay. the school newspaper. Yeah. So honing those skills in like graphic design really informs the way that you, you have these compositions. Yeah. But there are four four pieces they're like black and white mm -hmm. uh there i think there's a wood cut there's a uh pencil drawing yeah there's a uh what other print is there? it's a multicolored uh uh wood cut as well yeah so i see uh, those are would you say that those are some of your your early works and the yeah I, I i thought that i was going to go back to school and, and get my master's degree in printmaking mm -hmm. and i went to brookhaven college yeah and i took up printmaking and a professor came through and he, they said are you selling your work i said well i'm thinking about going to print uh to school and master's in printmaking uh, she said, are you selling your work? I said, yeah, I'm selling my work. I, at the time, I was in five galleries. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, they were, they were medium galleries. They mm -hmm. were, uh, and I was selling pretty well. And he said, how much do you sell, you know, a, in a given year? I think I was doing maybe 20, 25 pieces a year. That's pretty impressive. No, but they were small. They were small pieces. And he said, mm -mm. he said, oh, do you want to teach? I said, not really. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, you don't need to go to grad school. And I didn't. I share that uh, experience with you. Uh -huh. um, I also did not go to graduate school. Uh -huh. And it creates a certain kind of drive and fire in you mm -hmm. to, uh, like, that fuels a competitive spirit. Uh -huh. Or just, like, staying afloat with your peers. Exactly. Uh, and But it's, it's definitely a another path that leads um, to producing work in a different way. Do you feel like, I mean, it's obviously not a disadvantage because here we are in a museum yeah. talking about your work on the wall. Right. But are there any other things about um, not going through that experience that you feel uh, impacts your work? Well, Everyone I spoke to that went to grad school, a lot of people that I spoke to, uh, and this is, might not be the case for everybody, but they said that they, that the instructors tried to change and manipulate your work. And I'm glad that I didn't because my work is pure, it's innocent. It's, right. from, it's from me. Mm -hmm. And no one, no one but God gave me this. So it wasn't stirred or persuaded by anyone. I want you to talk about that story because... Okay. I I halfway fell off my chair when I heard it for the first time, but um, without any preface, just tell me how how you you came upon making this kind of work. So I was painting at the time. I was painting impressionism, and uh, someone told me that my work was derivative. Mm. They said. We've seen Impressionism before, and that's nothing new. So I was very downtrodden, and they said, you know, you'll sell a couple, but you'll never be the famous artist that you, you want. And I mean, they were very critical. Yeah. And I was really, really downtrodden and really depressed. And so, I, you know, I'm a praying woman, so I prayed about it and fasted. And I had a dream that an angel came to my door with a book of sketches, and he said that, I'm from your heavenly father. No, he said, I'm from your father. I said, do you know my dad? <laughs> I said, do you know my dad? And he said, he said, no. He said, it's, I'm from your heavenly father, the father that's in heaven. And he said, if you, I have this book of sketches, and mm -hmm. if you do these sketches, 
you would be very successful. He said there's a plan, a blueprint in here. Mm -hmm. And I took the book of sketches and I looked at them in my dream. And when I woke up, I was scared because I said, oh, my goodness, this is completely different than what I'm doing. And uh, I did some of the sketches. I started manipulating them, and I showed it to my peers. Now, I'm not dreaming anymore. This is in real life. They said, <laughs> they said, Avita, this is so different than what you're doing. He said, uh, they said, this is completely different. So in 1998 is when I had the dream, and I took some of the sketches, I mean, the, the sketches and turned them into images. Mm. And I was commissioned by the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage, and I was the first female to do the Congo Square poster the following year in 1999. Wow. What an incredible, like, was that your your sort of initial foray into exactly. art outside of outside Texas? Of my, outside of Texas, yeah. And with this new style that I was doing. Yeah. And it was a little more graphic, a little more decorative. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, you still could look it up, you could see the Congo Square 1999. Okay. Uh, it's still online, and I think there's still some for sale. And then Essence Music Festival at the time, they saw my work and they commissioned me to do their poster the same year. And it was wonderful. My parents got a chance to come. <laughs> nice. And That's an it, extra it bonus. It was so wonderful. And they got a chance to see all the different concerts. And it was wonderful. It was, it was a great time. That's an amazing yeah. uh, experience for an artist, especially like outside your your city mm -hmm. and for someone to recognize you beyond where you are is is quite uh and what was so exciting too is that this was like 25 years ago and you know all we had was you know the internet was barely trugging along and the dallas morning news did a feature of me in their paper and i was having a show in my my first studio that i had and i sold out you of, sold out. Uh, of my my work in my own personal studio. I had no representation Nobody at the time. Nobody taking any commission. No, no commission. <laughs> it was just me at the time. And I, you know, I think I had 20 paintings and I sold, I think, 18 of them. Wow. So at the time, it was just, it was a grand experience. Mm. In my first little studio. So that was your Dallas experience. How yeah. did you... Um, what was the leap? Because I, I got these works from Louis de Jesus in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. So what was the leap from Dallas to Los Angeles? Or was that so, a leap or was it a, a, a drive? It was a, it was drive. <laughs> so it went from Dallas to New York. I don't know if anybody heard of Peg Austin. Uh, he, she's, a, she's a senior art, uh, art dealer in, okay. in New York. She's been around for about 40 years. Mm. She saw me at the then uh, fine art show that was on Houston Street in New York. They had a black fine art show that was really high class. Mm -hmm. All the stars would come out, and it went on in the 90s. And it was the talk of the town during that time. And there was a couple of galleries, one in Hagerstown and an art dealer that would sell my work. Okay. And uh, she saw my work there, and she asked me if she could carry it. And uh, she showed my work to Denzel Washington, and he bought eight pieces. So that that kind of was a pivot. <laughs> that is yeah. quite the pivot. Yeah, um, quite <laughs> the pivot. Not the just sort of like, oh, <laughs> Christopher Blade just bought two of my pieces. <laughs> like Denzel Washington, okay. Yeah, so when he bought those pieces... I was working at this restaurant called V Eats at the time, and I was like the in Dallas. And yeah, okay. And I was like the they called me the 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 Satan creator because so I made all the meats. I made brisket and all those things. Vegan, vegan briskets, okay. vegan briskets. Yeah, and all the cheeses for the uh, char charcuterie boards. And then uh, what was what happened was uh, it was a Christmas Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. I was sitting next to my mother in in uh, I was visiting, and we heard that my boss was going to be on Guy Fieri's grocery game store. Mm. So we was watching it, and they introduced him, and they had my brisket, and they said he was the creator. <laughs> and we looked at each other. Me and my mother looked at each other, and she said, "What you gonna do?" 
So I started texting him. <laughs> Started a shouting match on the phone. You and Guy Fieri? Or no, you... me, and, me and my boss. <laughs> okay. Troy. Yeah. And uh, when I came back from visiting my parents, he had taken almost everything I made off the menu. Oh. Uh... And uh, then the next day, that's when um, Peg called me. And she said, you know, she said, I just want to let you know that Denzel bought, bought your work. So I quit. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I quit and I took my recipes with me. He didn't have them, so he couldn't create them. And I became, I got my, my second studio, and I never went back to the kitchen again. Oh, and this was what? In the 2019. 2019. That was very recently. That was, yeah, that's around the corner. That was around the corner, yeah. So now you are, yeah. January 2019 to be exact. I could tell you the date. Because <laughs> I remember that. It was, a, it was an accomplishment that I was able to quit. Yeah. Uh, and also get my own studio. And I, you know, I, I thought about it and I said, I don't know how I'm going to make it, mm -hmm. but I'm going to make it happen. And, you know, it was a sizable chunk, even though she took half 50%. Yeah. But it was a good chunk of money that I was able to live off because I live very below my means. Yeah. So I was able to have a studio and also have a a apartment mm -hmm. and create. And once I got on Instagram, I got on Instagram right after that. Yeah. And yeah, let's talk about that just for a moment because okay. I, I, every, most artists I know are on Instagram mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, with varying degrees of success. Right. Uh, how did you first get on that platform? And then how, how has it affected your work since you've been on it? Like, how has it, well, yeah. I got on Instagram because of this young lady right here. She called me up and she said, Avita, you need to be on Instagram. And I said, no, I don't think so. She said, you need to be on Instagram. So I, I downloaded the app and I started playing with it. I, I put a couple of pictures out there. And then the person I worked, I, I worked retail also. I worked at Lush Cosmetics. Okay. And I met this, this amazing young man. And he knew social media pretty well. And he started helping me. And I started getting followers. And a year later, I started getting all of these followers. And it kept building and building and building. What, what were you posting? Like I process? Posting, I was posting process. I was posting me working in my studio. I was po uh, posting finished products, finished uh, paintings, just a little bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I kept it hard. No personal stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you got all these followers. And... I started getting those followers. And then we started doing lives. Okay. Yeah. So we would do lives together. He would interview me. At the time, he was living in Dallas. Mm -hmm. he, we would do lives. And he would come to my studio and film me. And so one particular day, one of my collectors that bought my work in Ohio said, I want to tell you how I found you. He said, because, you know, I, she bought 12 pieces. And... She said, I was up one night and I was watching an interview with Samuel Jackson and he mentions you. <laughs> and I say, why did Samuel Jackson meet me? I say, he doesn't own any of my work. <laughs> and so, you know me, I'm fearless. I'm, I'm not scared of anything. So I DM'd him. Yeah. I sent him a message on Instagram. I looked at his, his feed and he was posting himself in the, post, in, in the, in the barber shop. I said, I'm just going to send him a message. I did. He answered me. Wow. 24 hours later. You and he said, DM Sam Jackson. I DM Sam like, Jackson and he. In, hey, what's up, Evita? What's going on? <laughs> well, I said, Mr. Jackson, I said, you don't know me, but I said, I think you know my work. And I said, uh, I said, it lives in, in, in uh, Denzel Washington's house. And he wrote me back and I could show you. It's on my phone. That's he said, I'm a fan. He told me, I'm a fan of your work. He said, yes, I've seen it at the Washington's house. He said, I don't own any, but he said, it has to change. Wow. And so uh, he, he liked my work. He started following me. And then he started texting me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, The story can just end right there. Um, it's like, and then here we are. <laughs> Go ahead. He started texting me on Instagram. And so he said, he, he sent me a message and said that he wanted to buy a uh, a present for his wife for their 40th anniversary. Mm. And I said, oh, he said, 
He, so I, I had a piece called Date Night, and he loved it. And me, being the starving artist that I am, I, sh I said, well, I have something better. I showed him the <laughs> largest piece that I had. In the city. I said, I think you want that one. It was called Ain't No Woman Like the One I Got. And I said, don't you like it? <laughs> and he said, yes. He said, how can I post it? How can I purchase it? And I said, well, I said, uh, here's my number. I said, you can call me and get the details. Now, I thought his assistant was going to call me. Right. But no. He called me five minutes later. Wow. It said Beverly Hills, California. And I said, I know this man is not calling. <laughs> I said, no. I answered the phone and I said, hello. And he said, hey, what's up, Avita? He said, this is Sam. <laughs> I, I almost fainted. It was just a mind blowing. It was a mind blowing. I mean, it was like, I, I still feel it was like it was yesterday. And that was in 2019. And uh, we talked about it. And it was like on the edge of COVID. Mm -hmm. I think it was 2020, really. Yeah. It was during COVID. Because I was going to a show in Ohio. And he scolded me. He said, you don't need to go to a show in Ohio. He said, you, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. He said, we want to keep you. You got to keep doing artwork. I said, I'm going to be all right. He said, well, call me when you get back. So I called him when I got back. He... He FedExed me a check, wow. and now he lives in his house. That's amazing. What an amazing story. I know. And we still text each other. Okay. Well, <laughs> Christopher said. <I'm> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it's such a, such a journey. Like, I mean, coming from, but, you know, there's something in the Port Arthur water, too, because uh, that's where Dennis Jacklin's from. That's yeah. where uh, Robert Rauschenberg's from. Yes. It's like, it's... Uh, but to have that kind of uh, creativity uh, nurtured there, uh, taken across the country, taken across the state, and have it like return here specifically yes. is a, a really big treat for us. Um, and let's talk a little bit about how your work ended up here. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, and I want to say, so we... We met each other I, in another life. I was uh, an art critic for an art magazine, and uh, I think that's where you know me from. Yes. But so Left we, higher. yeah, so mm -hmm. we uh, talked a little bit at the Dallas Art Fair mm -hmm. once. Yeah. And then we exchanged numbers, and then we kept the conversation going. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then one of the conversations was about this really awesome opportunity for the, the Guggenheim Fellowship. Uh -huh. And Avita said, Christopher, you know, would you like be so kind to write a letter of recommendation? And I was like, what an honor. I would be, it would be absolutely my pleasure. I'll do it, no problem. Um, three weeks after the deadline, <laughs> I realized that I did not write the letter of recommendation. Uh, but it also coincided with exhibition planning for this year. And I was like, how did I miss the deadline? And B, how can I work with a B <laughs> to sort of like make this like a full circle thing? Uh, but we talked about it. Yeah. And mercifully, the although the deadline had expired, um, the link to send the re recommendation was still alive and it worked out and <laughs> to you know i take no credit for it but i'm very happy to be sitting across from a 2023 guggenheim fellow yes which is uh one of the highest honors you can receive as a contemporary artist in the world so that's quite an accomplishment uh, we are not worthy. Um, but before I turn it over to questions, um, I want to hmm, tell me a little bit about the process of getting these, uh, putting these pieces together. There's a lot of collage elements, but there's also a lot of painting. And I wanted to know about that, and I want to know about um, how you decide on the scale of the works. Two uh, well, I know every artist says this, but the, 
I start out with a little eight by 10 uh, drawing on graph paper. I read somewhere where Romare Bitten draw, drew on graph paper and I just picked it up. And that's all I draw on is graph paper. I, it keeps everything balanced. Right. Precise, yeah, and price and yeah, the proportions. So I, I draw it on graph paper and then I use a over a projector to project it. Mm -hmm. And for for scale, it talks to me. It yeah. speaks to me. Uh, if it has a lot of characters in it, uh, to do to cut small pieces is very difficult. Of course. So I do them larger. To be honest, it's just practicality. Uh, I do them larger when there's a lot of characters. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them I do uh, when I do portraits. Uh, I the, my gallery does not like me to do small pieces. <laughs> of course they. Uh, they don't. <laughs> you know I'm doing some small pieces for my show this year, but they really don't like me to do small pieces. So. Uh, I do, and I love working big. I had never worked that big before. Yeah. And now when I work small, it's like I'm I'm go I'm stepping back. Yeah, you're restricting yourself. Mm -hmm. The the process starts with a drawing on canvas, and then I I paint the background uh, with acrylic, and I try to use the same elements that I paint the same uh, technique that when I paint the paper because I want it to all look cohesive. Yeah. So I use a lot of layering and, you know, I use, uh, sometimes I use, uh, uh, what, uh, sponges uh -huh. and all those. Yeah, I can things. see some, like, stuff. Yeah, going yeah, on sponges. Uh, that's what I use on the background. And then the paper, I use stencils. I splatter the paper. I douse it in paper. And then I, 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 I use paper towel. I do all kind of things to tint the paper. And then I come back and I use stencils. Mm. So it's a lengthy process. Yeah. It doesn't come together. You know, everybody asks me, how long does it take you to do a piece of work? It takes me months. Yeah. Because there's a lot of different elements that come to make it one painting. And I might just one day, I might just paint paper all day. Yeah. And I, I have two uh, flat files of paper. And they have thousands of pieces in there because sometimes I have leftover paint when I paint in the background. Mm -hmm. So I thin it out and then I splatter and I tint the background yeah. of, of papers. And I have, you know, and I'm very organized. I even have my my scraps organized really? by color <laughs> because okay. I have to do a lot of work. I do 30 to 35 pieces a year. I was going to say, you're pretty prolific. Yeah. Uh, the the time that it takes you for to complete a work uh, in months multiplied by how much work I work on several pieces at the same time okay but I have a gallery that loves me very much <laughs> yes. and they they have people that love my work and I hate I'm not bragging but every show that I have done with them have sold out wow. and I've done a, a total of eight shows including art fairs yeah so it's, it's eight show three solo show well two solo shows and six art fairs and every one of them have sold out that's pretty amazing. That's that's an un, uncommon experience and a really great problem to have. That means you're always in your studio and you're always making new things. Yeah, um, I am. Oh, there's another question I wanted to ask you. Okay, and maybe you answered that by talking a little bit about your process. But mm -hmm. the, the curiosity I have is because you, you know, there's a history of collage that comes before you, mm -hmm. you mentioned Romare Bearden, mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth Cat Catlett, mm -hmm. uh, and their contemporary collage artist, uh, Deborah Roberts comes mm -hmm. to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and even uh, in our space downstairs, our um, exhibition, our spring survey exhibition of mm -hmm. Houston-based artists, there are a couple of artists that are working in collage. Mm -hmm. How do you distinguish your work from collage that's come before or contemporary collage artists? Do you feel uh, an affinity, a connection that um, draws a through line to what's come before? Or do you feel like this is your own sort of uh, language you've created with your, your brand of... I feel that it's my own language because I treat the collage as a painting not as paper. Mm -hmm. I paint with paper. That's basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I put it together almost like a quilt. But I, a lot of people, when they see the work, they come up to it and they said, oh my goodness, this is a collage. 
So far away, it does not look like a collage. Mm -hmm. It looks like a painting. We're just having so yeah, I approach the work as a painting, not a collage. So the elements are very painterly. Even the paper that I use, I make it look like it's very painterly. So it and then for, so it's a work all very cohesive. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I could talk to you for another hour. But I want to open it up for questions. Uh, uh, we have one already. I have a question. So you're just talking about when you're developing your visual language. Uh -huh. It's very beautiful. Thank you. I see that fashion plays a huge role in the way that you present black people. Yes. Where did that, that love for fashion come and show you your work in this period of time? That little young lady behind you. <laughs> My mother used to take me to Josephine's uh, back in the day in Port Arthur, Texas, and dress me immaculately. And I grew up loving nice clothes. And that's, that's the love of fashion has always been in me. My grandmother was a fabulous dresser. She made a lot of my clothing. And that's when women dressed to the nines back then. Mm. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a person of the 60s. My grandmother was a person of the 40s. I just love the way women dress. And I want to portray the women and the men in my work that used to dress for success. Yeah. 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 Chris, congrats on, on your show. And Thank you. The fellowship. It's really amazing. Thank you. Um, so what I, I imagine, obviously, you paint what you paint because it brings you joy. Or yeah. Joy. Yeah. Is universal board that it's striking everyone else that it's selling out, you know, sure. Well, people say that it makes them feel of back of home and family, and it brings them joy. And that's the elements that I portray in my work. And I want people, when they see my work, I want them to be happy. And I want them to have joy. And we have we live in a world that's so chaotic and sad. And I want them to have a piece of joy in their home. And so that's my mission in life. You know, I feel that I am uh, an art evangelist because I speak joy. I, I paint joy. I paint love. Yeah. I paint family. And, you know, most of us have great families. I know I did. That's all I can remember is my family. Mm. And uh, you see, they're here with me now. And I'm still here with you. And I'm 63 years old. <laughs> my, my, my mom and my dad are here with me. Oh. And that showed me that shows you how much love I had all my life. That's all I knew. I never had any sadness. You know, I had sadness, but I had love for my family. Mm -hmm. Give me a moment to catch your breath yeah. and then uh, bad allergies. That's quite all right. You had your hand up there. The joy is it's precise, it's tight, it's gorgeous, it's dreamy, the colors are lush. But you put all that together and you get just this overwhelming happiness. Mm. So just very, very thrilled with what you've done. And I don't know how you, how you do it, how you stay so positive in the work. Well, uh, my, my upbringing as a Christian, uh, I'm a believer and I, that brings me joy. And also having a loving family, a close-knit family. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have wonderful friends. I have people that have been in my life uh, for years. Uh, not putting this one, young lady at the spot, but I've been knowing her since she was eight years old. And now she's an adult. And she's still with me. You know, I have very good, good people around me. Mm -hmm. And that keeps me happy. Show I could tell. So when you build your worlds, like this guy here, the shark rich man, doesn't uh -huh. feel like he's too far away from these people here as well. Uh -huh. So all these people sort of are in the same world or not too far from one another. And when you build your universe and you build these worlds, what is the key to keeping that element so tight where it feels like they are neighbors, like they are friends, and they all can actually have a conversation? with one another at some point in time? Well, I believe as an artist, you should have a cohesive body of work. 
and all my work tells a story. They all have the same narrative. They are people that are proud to be black and proud to have a sense of style and and they they love each other and they love their family. And that's what I build upon. And I I definitely remember um my grandparents instilling in me that we should always be a proud person, a, be a proud to be black, to be proud and always dress nice and always look nice and always speak nice. So being taught by old school people, uh, that's what I extend in my work. And I have that cohesiveness through all my work. Did I answer your question? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, Oh. The second part of that, do you see yourself more as a child in this world? Do you put yourself more as a child, or do you see yourself in all ages in your world? I will be forever a child. <laughs> I will be always. I will never grow up. Mm -hmm. You had a question back there, John. Yes, yeah, so now, in your work, you're also a representative of history. And yes. People here you know, say they were on the shoulders of others, but that's never swaggy for them. I'm not sure if you're good to comment and talk about the Harlem art shows that used to be just a fascinating mm. thing. Now, artists of color never had that experience. And then, if you would, I'd like you to talk about Frank Frazier. Uh, I still have, I got a photo of Frank in Miami in 2018. Oh, wow. And then the easiest, mm. one, the easiest one was to talk about um, William H. Johnson. And this is just a quick question. Did you ever see when the Smithsonian spread out exhibitions of William H. Johnson? They did one at Adam Carter. I saw that exhibition. I saw that exhibition. And that that exhibition changed my life. Mm. It really did. Because I saw his elements up, even though were paintings, they looked like collage. And they also showed black people of style and having fun and being happy and not being depressed. And so that's that affect me. So the um, the the show in New York, it was nothing like it. Never. It, I don't think there ever be a duplicate to that. Uh, at the time, Oprah would come through. Uh, Susan Taylor would come through. I mean, all the all the stars would come through, and it was the black element of style and poshness. And all the work would sell out. It was amazing. And it was done very classy. Everybody was trying to get into that show, and they couldn't because they would sell out the booths. It was a great time. And it lasted for 10 years. Hmm. Uh, it, was, it was something great. And it was in this historical building on Houston Street. And I showed there for five years with different with various galleries. And it was, that's, what, that's really where I started. Yeah. Yeah. And how important it was to black artists. And it was very important. Yeah. And and what was so good about that fair is they they were very strict. No prints, only originals. You know. Uh, it was it was really done right. It was like an art fair, like we, we go to our Basel Untitled, mm -hmm. but it was only with African American work. Yeah, and it was amazing. It was really really amazing. I want to get to your question before we, yeah. Hi. I know. I have a question about the eyes that are probably in your picture. Uh huh. So that element. Well, everybody says that I copy my eyes. That's what they say. Copy your own eyes? Yeah. That's what people say. But I believe that the eyes are the member, mirror of the soul. So I make the eyes as mysterious or I believe that I love big eyes. I think that they're fa fantastic. And so that's why the eyes are the focal point of the piece. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you are the focal point of this evening, mm -hmm. and we thank you so much for taking the time to come all the way from Dallas to visit with us this evening and share insights about your work. Thank you. Um,
So uh, with that, I want to say thank you so much for Evita. Uh, Evita, thank you so much for coming and thank you for being uh, making this show possible. It's been a treat working with you and uh, I know you're going to just keep coming back to Houston and visiting and checking out shows here. And uh, we look forward to a moment where we can work together again. Um, yeah. It's been such a treat. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.